Trigonometry, we've all heard the word, but do you actually know what it means? In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you as much as I can. Now the word trigonometry can be split up into three sections. Tri, meaning three. Gon, meaning shape. And then metri, meaning measure. So, trigonometry means three shape measure. Three sided shape, meaning the measurement of triangles. Now the fundamentals of trigonometry are all based on the development of right angle triangles. Now we label these right angle triangles in a very specific way depending on where they are relative to the angle in question and the right angle. Now this angle here is the Greek symbol theta and we like to use that to represent angles. X we like to represent lengths. Now opposite theta, the opposite length we always call the opposite, nice and simple. Then, the length in between the right angle and the angle in question, we call the adjacent side. So we say A, D, J. Then, the longest length in our right angle triangle is always the length that is opposite the right angle, which we call the hypotenuse. And this is where our favorite functions of sine, cos, and tan come in. Now, Sine, cos, and tan actually represent ratios. So we say sine of the angle in question. Sine is the ratio that measures how many times bigger is the opposite side relative to the hypotenuse. Meaning, we do the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Yeah? How many times bigger is the opposite relative to the hypotenuse? Now this value will always be less than 1 because the opposite side is smaller than the hypotenuse. Remember, the hypotenuse is the longest length in the triangle. Cos theta measures the ratio being how many times bigger is the adjacent side relative to the hypotenuse. So it's the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. Then finally, tan measures how many times bigger the opposite side is relative to the adjacent side. So opposite relative to the adjacent. Now there's a really cool way for you guys to remember this. Now the easiest way for us to remember the ratios is Sokotoa. So sine equals the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Cos is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse and tan is the opposite divided by the adjacent. Here's an example of a right angled triangle. The three, four, five, original Pythagorean triple triangle. So, with this triangle guys, can you tell me what sine, cos and tan are? Pause this video. Okay, so remember, sine, so, sine represents the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. The opposite to my angle theta is four, so we're gonna say four, divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the opposite length to the right angle, four fifths. Cos theta, Ka, cos, is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. The adjacent is 3 divided by the hypotenuse, 5. Then finally, tan, tan is the ratio of how many times bigger the opposite is relative to the adjacent. So it's the opposite, 4, divided by the adjacent, 3. Now guys, let's look at these graphs of sine, cos, and tan. Where do they come from? To draw the functions of sine, cos, and tan, what we do is we observe the unit circle. Unit circle, meaning it's a circle with radius one. And what I've done is I've drawn some right angled triangles inside of my circle. Can you see? The hypotenuse is one for all of my right angled triangles. Now if I want to sketch sine, remember Sokotoa, sine represents how many times bigger is the opposite side relative to the hypotenuse. So, it's the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. But, because we're talking about a unit circle, the hypotenuse is always one. Meaning, we're just measuring the opposite side in my circle. Now, because it's a unit circle, these opposite sides always have to be less than one. So, where does the angle come into this? The angle is the angle between my hypotenuse and the x-axis. So here is my angle here. The red triangle has a slightly bigger angle 
The green one has an even bigger angle. So what happens as I increase my angle of theta as I go around the triangle? So you should notice that as I increase the value of theta, the opposite side is getting bigger. So for my sine graph, starting at zero, because theoretically here, this line here, there is no angle. So if I was to draw a line, there's actually no triangle. There's no triangle here. There's no opposite side. So the sine graph starts at zero, and then it grows. Yeah, it keeps growing until we get to 90 degrees. Zero, 90. Then what happens is it starts getting smaller. As I keep going round, you can see this opposite side is getting smaller. So it comes up and it starts to get smaller until eventually I'm over here and there's no opposite side anymore. And as I go underneath the x-axis, can you see the opposite side would continue to get bigger, would continue to get bigger, but because we're below the x-axis, it becomes negative. And then again, as we go back round, we come back to zero. Now, how does it work for cosine? Something very similar, but cosine, remember, was the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So we're actually measuring the adjacent side. Now, over here, when theta is zero, the adjacent side is just one. Yes, this length here. So the cosine graph starts at one. But look at my triangles. Look at the adjacent side, the red one. Can you see it's getting smaller? So as we go along, yeah, as we go along, the adjacent side is just getting smaller. So the cosine graph starts from here, comes down, until eventually, so think of this as my adjacent side, as I come along here, there'll be no more adjacent side, we'll just have a vertical line upwards. Yeah, so no adjacent side. Then it does the same thing on the other side. The adjacent side actually gets bigger, but it's negative on the negative side of the x-axis. So it goes below, and then it just repeats itself. So it does the exact same thing on the other side. So can you see the symmetry here? So there's symmetry on the negative side. So this, symmetry on the other side. And there's your cosine graph. Tan, very interestingly, measures the ratio of the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So what you do is you just take your sine values and you divide it by the cosine values. So Something very interesting that happens with the tan graph is as we rotate around, remember the adjacent side is getting smaller, right? So you need to think, what happens to your values when you take a number and you divide it by a number that's getting smaller? Well, the value gets larger. You can do it in a calculator, so or your phone's calculator. You can take the number one, divide it by 0.5, then do one divided by 0 0.05, then do one divided by 0 0.005. Do you notice what's happening? The value just keeps getting larger. So when you take a number and you're dividing it by a number that keeps getting smaller, it's gonna keep getting larger, which is why the tan graph grows quite fast and it keeps going up forever until we get to this point, yeah, which is zero, when the adjacent side is zero, when the cos graph is zero. When you take a number and you divide by zero, try in your calculator, what happens? Gives no solution, it's a maths error. So on the tan graph, we have something very special, which is known as an asymptote. When theta is 90 degrees, there is what we call an asymptote because the adjacent side becomes zero. It's when the cos graph is zero. So we can't compute those values. Then what happens due to symmetry is it just repeats the same thing. But because the adjacent side is negative, the tan graph will look like this, but we have the negative values. But then again, we come to the same problem over here, just like over here, where you'd be dividing by zero, and then you'd have another asymptote. And then as we finish off, we have one more for the tan graph. Now the tan graph is quite a complicated graph. The sine and cos graph are easier to visualize when you're just looking at these lengths. But because tan is a division, it's a little bit harder of a graph. And even students, you know, in their mid-teen years, they do find this graph a little bit more uh, troubling to get their head around. But 
The sine and cos graph, definitely, you're just observing some measurements here. So these are the graphs, and this is the foundations to trigonometry. Okay, so you're all wondering, where can we use trigonometry? A good example is with my A-level students recently, we were using trigonometry to measure wave flow. So here would be my depth of water, and here is time. Say this is my base, so the base of wherever you're talking about, it could be sea level, it could be in the docks, and here are my waves. And we can use sine, cos to measure this wave. Another way you can use trigonometry is in astronomy. Say we have the Earth here, and we have stars and planets. We can use trigonometry and what we call small angle approximations to measure the distances of these stars or planets from each other and relative to the Earth. Because if you're observing from the Earth, this angle of you observing the star and a planet would be quite small. This angle here would be very small. And we can use small angle approximations to estimate distances between objects which are really far apart. One other way we can use trigonometry, this is a favorite, how to measure the radius of the Earth. You can take the Earth here, and we can use aviation to help us. We can take a plane that is flying however many meters above ground, and we can use that to measure the radius. Remember, it has some height above the ground because we can draw a tangent to a circle, and tangents meet the radius at 90 degrees, and we can do these kind of calculations to work out what the radius of the Earth is. So, trigonometry has tons of applications to real life. Some mathematicians actually say that the real mathematicians see the triangle in everything like I've done here. So that, guys, is a little bit of an introduction to trigonometry. Nice. Follow me for more content like this.